videos, we will start with the beginning, advanced accounting, and this chapter will specifically deal with the equity method as we deal with consolidations for accounting. So again, if we go back to GAAP, GAAP has concepts and standards in which we record transactions. And we have these standards so we're consistent and we also have a comparability b between other businesses. So we have standards in place for when there's a consolidation or when there's a merger or when there's um, an investor who owns various percents, how we handle those type of investments on the parent's financial statement, okay? So that's where we're gonna start here. <coughs> um, we are going to understand and gain insight into the methods that we record investments within another company. Our generally accepted accounting principles allow us three different ways to do it based on situations. We can record the investment in another company via what's called the fair value method. We can also report that transaction via the consolidation of financial statements, which we're gonna look at. And we also have something called the equity method, specifically what we're gonna be talking about today. The method that we pick depends on various factors that relate to the influence that the investor has over the subsidiary, or we'll call it the investor investee. So the investor invests a certain percent into an, a company as an investment based on which method we use is determined by the degree of influence. We're gonna get into all that. Another thing, just real quick, if I don't talk about it in class, do you need to know about it? No. If I bring it up, no, no you'll need to know about it. And if I really highlight it, no, it's absolutely gonna be on the quiz, okay? Anything that is not talked about in this class or in a PowerPoint, you don't need to mess with, okay? So how we determine the type of manner is going to be based on the degree of influence that the investor has in the investee. Whoops. So, um, <coughs> financial statements become consolidated together when the investor who purchases an investee, their ownership exceeds 50% of an organization's outstanding voting stock. Okay, these are standards. These are, these are guidelines we're gonna choose. Okay, if it's this, then we're gonna report it this way. Now, the only exception to that is when the control doesn't rest with the majority stockholder. So if in some manner, they, their ownership exceeds 50%, but somehow they don't have control. In this case, one set of financial statements are prepared that consolidate all the accounts of the parent company and all the subsidiaries. This is shown in the financial statements as one entity, okay? Now, this is used, consolidated financial statements are used when, what's the reason, guys? The investee owns over 50%, exceeds 50%, greater than 50. <coughs> it's not gonna happen when the control doesn't rest with that guy. There might be um, guidelines as to why that happens, but generally, money is king and power. They get the control. Now, we are going to, more in this class than in any other class I teach, start talking about some international standards but for the most part, 
you'll be hearing mainly GAP standards. This International Standard 28 from the IASB defines significant influence as the power to participate in the financial and operating policy decisions of the investee, the subsidiary, but it is not control or joint control over those policies. So they have power to participate in the financial and operating um, decisions, but it is not control or joint control over those policies. So that is how the Standard 28 defines significant influence. <coughs> if an investor has 20% or more ownership, it is presumed to have significant influence unless it is demonstrated not to be the case. And then if an investor holds less than 20% ownership, it's presumed it does not have significant influence unless influence can be clearly demonstrated. Now, hang in there with me. You're hearing a lot of mumble jumble, 50% less than 20, greater than 20. Hang in there, okay? It's all gonna gel together. So, when do we use the equity method? Significant influence means, what does it mean someone has significant influence? They are on the investees board of directors. I'd say they have significant influence if they're one of six or one of eight. When there's participation in the investees policy making process, that would mean significant influence. Material intra-entity transactions. What does that mean? <coughs> Between the parent and the subsidiary, they have sig many material, significant to an outside user's look, many transactions between the two of them. They co-mingle managerial personnel. If there's a technological dependency on that investor, the, invest, the investor has technological depend, um, excuse me, the investee has dependency technologically with the investor or there are other percentage of ownerships that we'll talk about. So the key here to know, significant influence would mean that they're on the board of directors of the investee. It means they participate in this decision making for the investee. It means they have material what is the term material? Well, it's based on how a user would see material, an external user, but material intra, between them, entity transactions. There's a commingling or an interchange of personnel, so they're kind of using each other's. Technological dependency. See, they're counting on, they're relying on. And ownership percentages that we'll get into. What's the purpose of this? When we have to use an equity method, we use it because we treat them as like one entity. We treat it as an investment in the, um, on the parent's books. And so, and there are other ways to do this, but when we know there's significant influence, then um, we're gonna treat it with the equity method and significant influence would be predicated on these items, okay? <coughs> now, <coughs> here is a good chart that allows you to see the criteria, what the level would be, and how these would be recorded on the financial statements. If the ownership level from an investor to an FVSD is less than 20%. We pretty much think they aren't gonna significantly have significant influence. And in that case, the way we're gonna account for that investment is at fair value or cost method, which we'll go over. If there is 
20 to 50% ownership from the investor to the investee. Then we assume if there's ability to, to significantly influence, we've got options to use either the equity method or fair value based on the ability to influence. Then if there's more than 50% because they can vote, we consolidate the financial statements and control through variable interest. We're not going to primary, don't worry about the last one. We're not going to really focus on that one. We're going to focus on less than 20% where there's not an ability to significantly influence. We're going to report it, the method of fair value. And then the 20 to 50% then, depending on the significant influence piece, we can determine to record it at the equity method or the fair value method. Then more than 50%, chances are we're going to be consolidating the financial statements. Know those, the criteria behind those. So this equity method. Examples are the best way for me to learn. Let's see, what are we talking about? What is this equity stuff all about anyway? <coughs> We're going to prepare a basic equity method journal entries for an investor, and we're going to describe the financial reporting for equity method investments. So here's an example. Big company owns 20% interest in little company purchased on January 1st of 2014 for 200000 So. Big company purchased 20% of little company for 200,000 bucks. Little reports net income of 200,000, 300,000, and 400,000 respectively for the next three years. And little declared dividends of 50, 100, and 200,000. So let's just get the scenario. Big purchases 20% a little. He per big purchase 20% um, a little for 200,000. And then it gives us the information about little, their income and their dividends. Okay, that's the information we have. How are we going to record these transactions? Big's investment in little, as determined by market prices, <coughs> was $235,000, $255,000, and $320,000 at the end of 2014, 15, and 16, respectively. Big company records these journal entries to apply the equity method. <coughs> so if we record the equity method in big buying little, what we will do is in 2014 will debit an investment in little company 40,000 and the credit is equity in investee income that uh, tr journal entry accrues 20% owned investee so the the Way, um, the salary the first year, or excuse me, the net income the first year was, excuse me, was 200,000, okay? See that? The first year it was 200,000, second year was 300, next year 400. So what we're showing, we are going to show that percent, that 20% of earnings, <coughs> since big owns 20% of little, we're going to show as an investment 20% of the net income. <coughs> so you see here, to accrue earnings of a 20% owned investee, we show the investment in little, we credit our equity of 20% of the income. Then we also need, under the equity method, we are going, when you receive a dividend, Okay, um, the dividend they received was 
The first year, 50,000, 20% of that is 10,000. So the way dividends are recorded under the equity method will show a debit to dividend receivable. We will reduce our investment in little company by that dividend. Then when we receive the dividend, we debit our cash, credit our receivable. So when a dividend is declared under the equity method, our dividend is going to be credited against our investment. Okay? If you think about it, logically, they own 20%. So under the equity method, we have to claim 20% of the net income. But then when you're giving dividends away, what happens? That's going to reduce that portion of the net income we're paying back out. Okay? So, first slide for how big records the transactions for little. Now, there are times we have to allocate some costs. Allocate the cost of an equity method investment and compute amortization expense to match revenues recognized from the investment to the excess of investor cost over investee book value. That sounds like mumbo jumbo, but it's going to make sense one step at a time. Fair values of specific investee assets and liabilities can differ from their book values. Excess payment can be identified with the accounts, but if the purchase price exceeds the fair value, there may be future benefits um, that we're accruing from the investment. So basically what's happening is we've got a book value listed on the books, but then we'll know at the time the fair value of what we're purchasing. We need to prorate the various assets and then determine if there's um, extra cash available that needs to be applied to a certain account or a specific area. So when we purchase the 20% ownership in little and that purchase price is greater than the book value, the difference needs to be looked at. We got to see why. What's, what are we purchasing? The additional payment gets attributed to an intangible, could be goodwill. Um, so this goodwill we're going to create from the purchase of an investment. You get what I'm saying? Assets may be undervalued on the investee's books because the fair values of assets are different than their book values. The investor may be willing to pay extra because future benefits are expected to accrue from the investment. So basically, this is going to be common. There's always going to be adjustments that need to be made when there's a, a purchase that occurs. And we need to um, figure out what is the, the difference and what are we going to record it to, which we'll get on in just a minute. <coughs> now, there are times we might start with a different method than the equity method. And we might have to change our investment to the equity method and retroactivate it if an investment previously that was recorded using the fair value method reaches the point where significant influence is established then what we'll need to do is we're going to need to restate this investment under a new method, the equity method. All accounts get restated retroactively so that the investor's financial statement appears as if the equity method has been applied from the date of the first acquisition. So we do that so we can compare one year to the next, okay? Once that benchmark hits, that significant influence is, is present, then we're going to change it to the equity method. But in addition to just changing it, we have to retroactively restate the previous financial statements 
so we can compare them, okay? We can compare one financial year to another. No. Um, so what we just went over was the equity market, and it's clearly like your your vision is the all money market. Then when we get under twenty percent, would you be under a fair value or? <coughs> um, we're going to go to that if we're on the equity method, and then we transfer over to the fair value method. How we're going to handle that? But for now, if we're at the fair value method. And because of significant influence, we realize, wow, we need to change our reporting to the equity method. We're going to have to not only change it, but go back and retroactivate all those other years under the equity method. Um, let's just highlight on this investee com OCI, comprehensive income. But other comprehensive income is defined as revenues, expenses, gains, and losses that under GAAP get included in something called comprehensive income, but really aren't part of net income. Um, accumulated other comprehensive income includes some unrealized gains. Um, and basically, we know there's realized gains, which we generally record, okay? Unrealized gains are gains, but they've not been recorded yet because they're not sold yet. Remember, we realize things when we sell things, but we're always keeping current with what is present and what, when they do um, are sold, what is the effect on the financial statements. <coughs> so there are some gains and losses Sometimes we've got foreign currency that can be adjusted and we can have a gain as a result of the foreign currency, but we're still holding on to it. So we've not had a realized gain, it's unrealized. These don't get put in the income, net income of the income statement. But what happens to those, this unrealized gain or loss that's happening plays out in the stockholders equity section. And this affects the um, changes in the net assets under the equity method. Hang in there with me. Not realized. Realized is a part of net income. These are unrealized gains that we still need to show as a part of the investment. Um, let's not worry about that right now. There are times when we've got an impairment loss. Now generally with conservatism, which is a, a key in the accounting um, language that we always want to be prudent and careful in what we record. However, with impairment losses, those impairment losses are going to be reduced right away in this scenario. A permanent decline in the investee's fair market value gets recorded as an impairment loss, and the investment account is then reduced to the fair value. So it's going to get reduced instantly, that impairment. When accumulated losses are incurred and dividends paid by the investee reduce the investment account to zero, no further loss can be accrued. So any impairment or reduction in the value of this company going to instantly reduce that investment in the company. Once we're at zero, we can't go any farther, okay? There's no more to go. The investor discontinues using the equity method rather than record a negative balance. The balance remains at zero until ultimately we can get profits that get rid of all the losses, okay? Temporary declines get ignored, but when we've got an impairment that's permanent, we're going to record it right away. Okay. Um, boy, I'm, it's a lot of information here. I, I feel like we need to just work on a problem, but 
let's do that. Let's just take a minute and work on a problem because there's just so much going on here. Okay, so let's pull up the book which I will open up so we can see this online. And you also will have the solutions in Moodle, okay? It's <coughs> um, a white book. There it is. So let's look here. I'm sorry, 28? Yeah. Okay, so. Let's look at number six here. On January 1st, Puckett Company paid 1.6 million for 50,000 shares of Harrison's voting common stock, which represents a 40% investment. No allocation to goodwill or other specific accounts were made. Significant influence over Harrison is achieved by this acquisition so Puckett uses the equity method, which is correct. Between 20 and 50%, significant influence, you use the equity method. It's telling us that there is significant influence achieved. Harrison declared a $2 per share dividend during the year and reported net income of 560000 What is the balance in the investment in Harrison account? found in Puckett's financial records as of December 31st. So what do we know? We know they purchased 1,600,000 for 50,000 shares. That was 40%. We know they um, demonstrate significant influence, which means the acquisition method means we're going to have to take a portion of the income, apply it, and subtract the dividends. So let's look and see how we'll do this to come up with the right answer. Okay, so for purposes of our scenario here, we've got the, let me make this bigger. We've got the acquisition price of what? $1.6 million. Uh, whoops. And then 
what was the percent equity in the income for the year? 40% of 560,000, right? So the equity income would be 560,000 at 40% because that's hit their share of ownership. So what is 560,000 at 40%? 224,000, okay? Now we need to take away the dividends from this investment. So the dividends paid were 50,000 shares at two bucks a share, right? Because we had 50,000 shares in it. Two bucks a share is 100,000. Correct? So we're going to take away 100,000. And at the end of the period here, our investment in Harrison Corp as of 1231, 1,724,000. Do you follow what we're doing here? Let's do a couple more just so we gather some concepts and then we can expound on them. Expand, I should say. Any questions on that before we move on? You guys okay? Now let's look at number seven. So 1,724,000 A would be the answer, okay? Next, number seven. We've got, in this scenario, in January of 2014, Domingo Inc. acquired 20% of the outstanding common stock of Marta's Inc. for 700000 So we took 20%, cost us 700000 to purchase 20%. This investment gave Domingo the ability to exercise significant influence over Martis. Martis's assets on that date were recorded at 3,900,000 with liabilities of 900,000. Any excess of cost over book value of the investment was attributed to a patent having a remaining life of 10 years. So think about it. When a patent is created within a company, it's not an asset, is it? It's research and development expense. So there is a benefit here that isn't being treated on the books. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we know we're paying more for it and they're making it very clear. There's an intangible here as to why we're paying more for this. In 2014, Martis reported net income of 170,000. In 2015, Martis reported net income of 210,000 and dividends of 70,000 were declared in each year. What is the equity method balance of Domingo's investment in Martis? as of December 31st, 2015. Okay, let's take it, pick it apart. It can feel overwhelming initially, but we're just gonna pick them apart and do one step as, at a time. So the first thing we're going to do is, back to our paper here, what was the acquisition price? 700,000. Now, we have income that was accruing. Here, let me. We have income accruals in 2014. We had um, 170,000, 
20% of that is what? 34,000. Sorry. Sometimes it's sitting right in front of me and I Then in so this is in 2000 actually And then in 2015, we have 210 at 20% is 42,000. Okay? Does that make sense? So we've got, we're showing our income here, our percentage of um, increase in investment for 2014 and 2015. Now we're also going to have, oops, an amortization. Now, how we're calculating this amortization, let's go over here and show. We acquired, we acquired the company for 700,000, right? <coughs> what are the assets we acquired the um, book value of the assets we acquired, the net, the net assets, three million nine hundred. But what is our liability? So we acquired basically three three million. Okay, so we took three million. So we, the um, net assets acquired, acquired net assets is going to basically be 3 million times 20%, right? We only bought 20%, <coughs> correct? So 3 million at 20% Actually, I should show that here. Three million at 20% is how much? 600,000? So basically, we bought 20% for 700,000. But the net assets on the books only show 600,000. That's goofy. What's the difference about the patent? Okay? So the net difference, this is excess of cost over book value for the patent, which is the 100,000. Sorry guys, my phone's ringing. I'm sorry. Which is the 100,000. Now, didn't it tell us this patent has 10 years remaining? So we're going to take this excess, this 100,000, and amortize it one-tenth a year. It's got 10 years remaining. So we're going to show the annual amortization 10 years is going to be 10,000 a year. Does that make sense? Any questions? So we need to show in 2014 amortization of minus 10,000 2015, what's the amortization? Minus 10,000. Are you with me so far? Now we've got to deal with dividends. The dividends in 2014 
he they paid out seventy thousand in dividends. What's our portion of it? Twenty percent, which is going to be fourteen thousand, right? And in two thousand fifteen, they did the same. Have we got everything in here? I think we have. We started with the cost, the acquisition cost. We added to it our income, which the, our percent of income we have to account for. We subtracted from it that patent piece, right, that we're amortizing. We took out our dividends. I think we're good. So we will account for the investment in Martis as of 1231.15. We bought it for 700. We added our portion of income, subtracted our portion of dividends, took care of the amortization that happened for two years because this is the end of 2015. So the investment should be 728. Is Do we have that right? 728. Is this helpful? <coughs> Let's look at number eight. Franklin purchases 40% of Johnson Company on January 1st for $500,000. Although Franklin did not use it, this acquisition gave Franklin the ability to apply significant influence to Johnson's operating and financing policies. Johnson reports assets on that date of one Point four million with liabilities of five hundred thousand. One building with a seven year remaining life is undervalued on Johnson's books by one hundred forty thousand. Also, Johnson's book value for its trademark is undervalued by two hundred ten thousand. During the year, Johnson reports net income of ninety thousand while declaring dividends of thirty thousand. What is the investment in Johnson Company's balance, the equity method, in Franklin's financial records as of December 31st? Now, guys, this is interesting here. They're trying to trick you a little. This gives um, Franklin the ability to sig apply significant influence even though he doesn't. Does it matter? He can, though, okay? We don't care if he does or doesn't. This investment then creates the need because of the significant influence, if he uses it or not, to use the equity method. So let's look and figure out, again, how are we going to show the investment in Johnson? Do you want me to give you a couple minutes to try it on your own? Do you want it or do you want me to just do it? Okay, who else wants me to do it? Who wants to try on their own? Okay, try on your own. 